Hi, everyone. Our next speaker truly understands the challenges that face rural and safety net hospitals who are trying to navigate the ever-changing regulatory requirements, reimbursement models, growing workforce challenges, and deepening health disparities. He has 20 years of experience in healthcare and nonprofit administration and is nationally recognized as a leader in health equity and transforming rural healthcare through an innovative approach. His experience also includes six years as serving as CEO of rural Kearney County um, Hospital in Lacken, Kansas. <laughs> he now provides leadership and direction in the development of execution, excuse me, uh, of the Colorado Hospital and Healthcare Association, rural strategies and advocates for rural hospitals and health systems. During the session, he will provide practical tools that can be used by leaders to continue pr to promote equitable systems that improve the health outcomes of the patients and the communities they serve. Please join me in welcoming to the stage the Vice President of Rural Health and Hospitals for the Colorado Hospital Association, Benjamin Anderson. Thank you. I have two 10-year-olds uh, at the house and two eight-year-olds at the house, and we use our outside voice inside all the time. So if you can't hear me in the back of the room, just one of these, I can up it. Um, thank you all so much for having me. Um, I, uh, well, it was suggested, I think Vicki suggested early on, hey, can you come at the beginning of the day to hear about the work that's going on in rural, rural Arizona so it would inform the comments that you'll make toward the end of the day? And that was absolutely the right move. It was so helpful for me to, I mean, I snapped pictures of every one of those to bring them back to Colorado um, because... Any good idea coming out of here that can help save somebody else's life, improve somebody else's life, it's a good thing. So we, we're pulling innovation out of here that we're going to take back to Colorado. I am, by nature, a storyteller. And so you're going to hear a few stories from me, assuming that I can get the... Does it work? It works. All right. Um, this is Jonathan Paul Anderson. I call him John Paul at the house. And uh, this is a typical morning for John Paul. As I mentioned earlier, we have two 10-year-olds at the house, two 8-year-olds. And uh, can you all see the screen? I can back up a little bit. Um, and so mornings can be a little bit hectic. Getting four kids within 22 months of age awake, fed, cleaned up, dressed, lunches packed, homework, tucked away, all the things to get them out the door. And so if you wake them up a minute early, that's punishing. If you wake them up a minute late, um, oh, that's even worse. So we don't, we don't, want, we don't want to get them up any sooner than we can, um, but, but we get them up around 6.15. they got to be out the door at 6, 6, uh, or 7.15. Around 6.30, I come downstairs, and John Paul's down there with no pants on. And in general, in a, in a house full of boys and girls, if boy girl sets, the tens are boys and girls and the, the eights are boys, not a good idea to walk around with no pants on. So I said, John Paul, I, I need you to go up and get your pants on. We call them britches at the house. Please go get, get your britches on. Well, I get up there, and that was at 630. I get up there at 645 to check on where he is with his getting dressed strategies, and he's sitting on his bed with no pants on. And I got short at that point. I said, he started, he started to say, hey, Dad, I need, and I stopped him. And I said, what you need to do is get your britches on. And I was short with him. I was direct. I was frustrated. And he just melted, melted down. He just said, Dad, you're making an assumption, which is a pretty big word for an eight-year-old. And then I realized what happened the day before. We couldn't see the floor in the boy's room. And so I had asked his brother, please clean the room. Well, there are get it done well folks, and there are get it done quickly folks. And he is the latter and figured out the most efficient way to get that done so he could go play outside would be to treat all the laundry like the dirty laundry. So everything went in to the soiled laundry, and a 10-year-old boy and an 8-year-old boy really know how to soil some laundry. So any other laundry you put in with the laundry they did soil, it's over. And what our son was trying to tell me is, Dad, I don't, I don't have any clean pants. What I need are some clean pants. I made the assumption 
than what he needed to do without asking him. And in healthcare, that's deadly when we assume what others need without actually asking them. It's so, so dangerous. So I have a teacher of mine at, uh, in grad school who went from New Hampshire down to University of Texas to start the Value Institute for Health and Care at UT. Her name is Elizabeth Tysberg. In 2005, she wrote a book with a guy named Michael Porter from Harvard called Redefining Healthcare. She's sort of like the matriarch of value-based care. She introduced these concepts 20 years ago, 18 years ago. And I uh, developed a friendship with her when she was my teacher at Dartmouth, and she went down to Texas, and my heart went down to Austin, Texas with her. First of all, my family's from Texas, so I was so glad she found, found the way like to, to, to Texas down there. But she started this Value Institute and a master's program in healthcare transformation. And one of the things that she taught me when we were together was, and it still teaches me, is any time the diagnosis is wrong, the result is waste or harm. Any time the diagnosis is wrong, the result is waste or harm. And we can ensure the accurate diagnosis by first asking the right questions. Asking the right questions to the right people, right? And, and those are the people that are most affected by the problem. Another hero of mine in my life is a woman named Sister Mary Jean Ryan. She's a Catholic nun from St. Louis whose hospital system, when she was leading, was the first ever to win the Malcolm Baldridge Award for Quality, which is the nation's highest award for quality. Um, she's a relentless advocate for equity, a relentless advocate for the poor, for the underserved, for the marginalized, and she had no patience for avoidable harm. And so she would tell, she taught me um, that any time a patient is harmed due to broken processes or even good processes that could be improved, we've committed a moral failure because that harm is avoidable and therefore it's morally unacceptable. She could say that with the credibility of a nun. I want to be just like her when I grow up, minus the Catholic nun part. I'd be a lousy nun. Um, but but she, she also taught me that systems heal people and systems harm or kill people. And developing good systems requires good strategy. And it's the same stuff that I got to spend from 10 a.m. in the morning until now hearing about from you all. It's really redefining microsystems that are driving, ultimately driving Outcomes. So a little story about where I spent 11 years of my life in West Kansas. Uh, ran a hospital that had a surgery center, some rural health clinics, uh, uh, assisted living, attached assisted living unit uh, with, with, with uh, 40 beds, another, uh, or, sorry, with 30 beds, another 40 bed uh, skilled nursing facility, including dementia care and, and, a, and a memory unit. And um, so just a, a home for 70 seniors all wrapped into one place. We had full scope family medicine that we're caring for folks. And I mean, we delivered a lot of babies. We took care of people at the beginning of life, at the end of life. And uh, we were, um, and what my wife would say is the center of the universe. She's from rural Kansas. Um, I might call it the rectangular state in the middle. That's where we lived. Um, we were taking care of the, the southwest corner of, of Kansas. Now, there were several hospitals out there, but from, a, from an obstetric standpoint, there were only three in this whole region that, was, that were delivering babies, three or four. And we were among those three or four that were, you, we saw women drive two hours to deliver a baby in, in our hospital. Um, I didn't know this when we moved there, but uh, our little town of Lake in Kansas was, the, was named by the Washington Post as the 10th most remote town in the United States. And that was not a contest I knew we were in when I moved there. And it's certainly not one we were trying to win, but it was measured literally by driving distance to a city of 75,000 or more. And whoever did this study with the Washington Post had no idea the grant implications for naming us the 10th most remote. I mean, we were so attractive from a, from a, from a funding standpoint. They thought it was a joke, probably. Oh, look, look at these middle of nowhere places, right? So they, when we looked at the list closer, though, Eight of the 30 most remote communities in the United States save Alaska. We were delivering babies from eight of those 30 the previous 12 months. So when you might look at the ones, the smallest ones here on the left, um, we're up there with Montana in, in middle of nowhere places, except this is Montana. Y'all know where I'm going with this. This is Kansas. <laughs> To be fair, to be fair, this is half of Montana. This is all of Kansas. It's all of us. But this is also Kansas. What most folks don't realize is that people from 40 countries 
lived in our service area. Why do you think that was? Any idea? It had to do with something that existed 18 miles away from us, which was the world's largest, literally the world's largest beef packing plant. Pushed 5,000 cows per day through that beef packing plant, and it took 17 minutes and 51 seconds to take a cow that was hanging upside down and send it all the way through to ready to be on a grocery shelf. 17 minutes and 51 seconds. And they were doing that backbreaking work from Southeast Asia, from Northeast Africa, from all over Africa, really, from all over Central and South America. All these countries were represented in our service area, but you wouldn't think of that in the middle of nowhere, rural Kansas, right? We had this cross between, this collision between ethnic and racial disparities and geographic disparities, and maternal health was at the center of it. Because we had women from Somalia, for example, who experienced female genital mutilation as babies. Like, so for those of y'all don't know, I'm not going to get too deep into the details of it, but there's this horribly abusive and grotesque procedure that leads to a little girl having a, a hole about a little smaller than a number two pencil that would allow urine and menstruation to go through. And somehow they are to conceive and deliver babies like that, so they enter adulthood with this, this childhood trauma, with all this stuff going on. And we've already got maternal health disparities on the rise. We've got some really gnarly things happening out in our area. So all that's going on on a daily basis in our healthcare delivery system, right? And that, that would be an example. Um, so this picture is taken five miles away from our house where I live. Um, I just want you to pause for a moment. Go through an exercise with me. Take that, take that image in and then close your eyes. Take a deep breath and imagine 100 degrees outside. And, and what might that smell like? Well, they say in West Kansas, it smells like money. Doesn't smell like any money I've ever had. That smells like dookie. That's gnarly right there. So that's, that's the summertime, all right? I took this picture when I was walking into one of our, our clinics. Now, I'm not a physicist. What direction are those icicles pointing? Anybody know? That's sideways. So the, the phrase we'd use in West Kansas when I'd see something like that, pretty plain speak, that ain't right. <laughs> That's cold. That is North Pole cold to me, especially if somebody comes from a tropical climate. So that's the summertime. That's the wintertime. The grandchildren of the survivors of the American Dust Bowl are the anchors of this rural community. That's who lives there. So there we were in a, in a facility where our physicians are practicing full scope family medicine, meaning that family doctors do surgical OB and inpatient and outpatient psychiatry and ER and trauma and nursing home uh, care or el elderly care, house calls with little black bags. I mean, this is, not, this is like you know, old school full scope family medicine. And we had all these disparity challenges. Well. Elizabeth challenged me. She said, healthcare is, is simply health outcomes for the money spent. That's the value in healthcare. So, as you think about value, it's changes in health outcomes over cost. And, and who defines the health outcome? The patient defines the health outcome. Government doesn't define the health outcome. The healthcare system, the physician doesn't define it. The hospital CEO doesn't define the health outcome. It's the, the patient that does that. She said, so often we ask patients, uh, when they leave the hospital, if the sheets were soft and if the bed was comfortable and if the nurses were nice, if the food was warm and delivered on time. Essentially, we're asking about hotel services, right? How did we do? And her challenge to me was, what, what, should, what should we be asking patients when they leave the hospital? And I said, well, how are you? She said, yeah. That's not often what we're asking, but did they actually come in get what they came in for, and if they came in because their blood pressure was high, is their blood pressure lower? They were having chest pain. Do they still have chest pain? They get their blood pressure meds filled. They get a ride to the pharmacy. Do they have prescription drug insurance? I mean, all these things we don't ask. We just we make assumptions on what we thought we knew, but we don't. And she again said, when, health, when the diagnosis is wrong, everything we do is waste or harm. So who is most qualified to identify those outcomes? Obviously, the patients are. So she challenged me to survey our community. 
and I'll tell you what happened. So we, we developed a survey in partnership with the University of Kansas School of Medicine's Preventive Medicine Public uh, Health um, Department. And that meta, after we got the demographics out of the way, age and gender and, and insurance type and zip code and all the things, right? The, way, the, way, the denominator when we think about disparities, we got all that out of the way. Then we asked, how do you define your health and wellness from several commonly accepted terms? How broad do you see it? Is it physical only? Is it more holistic? From several commonly accepted terms, it checked the boxes. And then in the major, or no, then who, who do you believe is responsible for your health? Is it the health system? Is it your own personal choices and the environment? What do you think is the, the greatest determinant? And then we asked in the major sectors of society, healthcare, public health, early childhood development, research and extension, faith community, employer, community as a whole, in each of those sectors, from this list, individual list in each of these sectors, which of the following services would help you improve your health and wellness as you define it? And then what would you want to see more of? It took about 10 minutes to complete the survey. They got 10, 10 uh, chamber bucks. Do you all have chamber bucks in your communities? It's like shop at home money. It's like a religion in West Kansas. Like, it does not go to Walmart. Like, we keep the money here, right? So... If the businesses were behind it because they knew the money stays in town. It goes to groceries. It can go to you know gas and just basic you know basic needs, and and the local bank puts out the chamber bucks. So it was money coming into town with grants, and so we put that out and we engaged what Malcolm Gladwell calls the tipping point in his in his book the tipping point connectors, people that knew everybody, like and so the classic or or several hundred year old example is, is Paul Revere. Everybody knew Paul Revere. Paul Revere is influential. He listened to Paul Revere. There was another guy that took a very similar route down, down, that, down that coast um, with the same message that the, the British are coming. And there's only two documented, you know, uh, two pieces of documented evidence that, that that ride ever happened. But everybody knew Paul. So Paul, so we found the Paul Revere's in our community. And they were these two folks because 40% of our uh, our community was uh, Latin American, Hispanic. They were, they were um, from that region of the world, and 60% were white. And so 40% of our respondents were Latin American, Hispanic, 60% were white. So we, so we looked at, we wanted to make sure that our respondents matched the community that we were in. And we sent them out to do this survey, and we got an 85% response rate, household response rate. Anybody have a public health background? That's bananas. 85% with less than 5% duplicate rate. And they did it by going, using community-based participatory research methods, going into the places where people were. Coffee shops, going to school registration, showing up at the, showing up at the, uh, at the, um, the, the county fair over the summer and, and church potlucks or, or subway lunches after church or showing up at pool parties or going in and cleaning out the bank of everybody that's working at the bank. Certainly the hospital was in for this, right? So we, they went in and they figured this out. And, and so we, um, we, we were able to capture this. Tyson convinced them to pull 100 people off the line that were working at Tyson on the clock and let them fill it out on the clock at Tyson because we couldn't get past their pit bulls. <laughs> and like other gnarly things in some of these trailer parks. It was, we couldn't figure out how to get to them, so we went into their workplace, and, and Tyson saw the importance and said, if you'll, if you'll share this data, the aggregate data with us, sure, we'll give you access to them. We'll even let them fill it out on the clock. So that's how we ended up with, a, with an 85% response rate. But we, we leveraged relationships within the community. We even went to the seed salesmen that worked with all the farmers and said, all right, when, wh which cafe are they at? Where do they go in the mornings? How do we get to them? Can you call ahead? Will they answer their door if we tell them? Because no, we're not with the government. <laughs> we're not here to spy on you, right? But we, we needed this information. It was so important. And I'm going to share a little window into what we learned from that data. Right? There's so much more, but in 40 minutes, 50 minutes, we, we can't get through all of it. But I'm going to share a little indication of what we learned. And we can talk more about it in the Q&A if you want to. When we asked about healthcare services, in every single category in healthcare, white folks were more aware of services than Hispanic, Latin American folks. In every single category. When we asked, what do you want to see more of? In all but three categories, Hispanic, Latin American folks more aware of services than white folks were. In all but three, and the only three exceptions were mental health, support for caregivers, and hospice care. And as we did more qualitative research and interviewing, we figured out there's some cultural reasons why those numbers might look different 
because of family expectations just and, and, and some stigmas around behavioral health, those types of things. Those three were the only exceptions. We had to stare this in the face because we couldn't unsee it. If a service is not available in a language a person understands, at a price they can afford, a location they can get to, at a time they can access it, in a context they can take in and understand, it might as well not exist or worse. Picture the Jim Crow South. This drink and fountain night for you. Here is a beautiful service that we offer, starting with beginning of life, moms and babies. It's available from 9 to 5. If you have this payer type, in this language, right, we were not accommodating the population that we were serving, and we can't unsee that. It just is what it is. So this is, us tell, this is me telling on ourselves. For Americans to truly thrive, I think about the national creed we have. We hold these truths to be self-evident that all people are equal. They're, engaged, or they're endowed by their creator with certain inalienable rights, and among these are life and liberty and the pursuit of happiness. If that creed is to become a reality, we have to begin by asking hard, insightful questions. Why do the numbers look different? Why do they exist? We didn't have a health equity problem. That's the urban folks thing. Except we did. Except we did. We must be willing to take what we are already measuring and divide it by people group. And I'm going to say something bold here. Race is an important, even defining issue in the United States right now, and it is not the only denominator. In fact, ignoring any disparity legitimizes all disparities. Race is not the only denominator. Geography, denominator. Gender, denominator. Insurance type, denominator. Socioeconomic status, poverty level, denominators, income level, those, those are all things, all opportunities to take what we're already measuring, divide it by people group, and see what happens. If the numbers show up different, then we have to have the courage, the fortitude to lead, lead efforts that address those disparities. If, if these truths are self evident in us, I believe the future of this nation relies on our leaders' ability and willingness and courage to do. That this is the foundation for health equity work that you have already described. I did not include a definition of health equity, definition of disparities. Y'all obviously know what those are. You're far along. Like you're doing courageous work already. Um, rural America has a seat at the health equity table. We belong there at the health equity table, even if sometimes it feels like somebody spitting our food. We belong there at that table. It is impossible to solve these structural problems with individual solutions. I'll give you a case in point that's simple. Turns out, after all this burnout talk, breathing exercises don't fix call schedules. <laughs> Turns out, no matter how deep you breathe, you're still on call. No matter how mindful you are, the EMR is still busted. Right? No, no matter if you take a day off or a nap, right, it's still an unjust work culture. The only thing that fixes the call schedule is fixing the call schedule. And the structural stuff is a lot harder to change. So who has the responsibility of leading this change? I'm going to give you four examples. All right? First of all, uh, we're going to look at a clinic manager who revolutionized maternal health equity. Anybody believe that's relevant right now in the United States? A dishwasher who transformed healthcare access for women, a health aide who tackled racial tension and emotional safety at work, and a doctor who fixed MA turnover. Or MA turnover. All right. Um, maternal health equity an issue? Access for health to healthcare for women an issue? Uh, emotional safety at work an issue? Is, is workforce turnover, medical assistant turnover an issue? Huge issues right now, right? Here are frontline folks to solve these problems. I'm going to begin with this one. So we had the data that showed we had a problem. We looked deeper at the clinical data and figured out that among the women uh, in, our, in our delivery, in our community, our baby was, our hospital was in a town of 2,200 delivering about 400 babies a year. So they're driving from all over the region to come in to, to deliver with us. 14% of those women were delivering, or were, were delivering with gestational diabetes mellitus. Anybody familiar with GDM? Some of you clinicians, 
Um, so that's just, that's diabetes developed during pregnancy, all right? So pregnancy essentially puts a mom's body in a pressure cooker. The stuff that's going to come out 10, 20, 30 years later is going to show up during pregnancy because it's a stressor on a woman's body. So you're going to see this stuff start showing up. It's like looking into a, into a crystal ball as to about what's going to happen in the future. And the way it's managed during pregnancy determines 50% more likely or not whether that woman's going to be diagnosed with type 2 diabetes 10, 15 years later. All right? So if it's not managed, then when you have her 10, 11, 12, 13 pound hypoglycemic babies, LGA babies are large for gestational age, big babies that get stuck in the birth canal, right? Um, and that's a problem. That's a real big problem in a place with no OBGYNs where you have family doctors doing C-sections. And you don't want that kind of thing happening where we were. We figured out that 14% of our moms had GDM. Of those mothers, 84% of them were li delivering large for gestational age babies. Big babies. I remember rounding one week on, on, on maternity care and discovering a 10-pound, a 12-pound, and a 14-pound baby on the same hallway in the same week. Like 14-pound baby, that is no bueno, all right, when, when we're delivering babies. So this woman, uh, Lacey Molel, was our clinic manager and was a mother who had gestational hypertension and I believe GDM and was experiencing some of these issues and, uh, and was motivated to do something about it. So she used a six-question tool, brought together a team, used a six-question tool that I'll hand to you. We're going to review it at the end. First question is, what outcome do we want to improve? Well, we knew we had this, this prevalence of GDM, and the, the, those mothers were... Uh, Delivering um, with gestational diabetes, complications for the mother included all these gnarly problems, uh, complications for the baby, low blood, blood sugar level, a childhood obesity, metabolic syndrome. The desired outcome we needed to change was a lower percentage of these babies born of fetal macrosomia or GDM. All right, so that's number one. Number two, who are the stakeholders that could help improve the outcome? We just started developing a list. Moms and babies, physician, hospital employees, these were folks Beyond just the obvious one, obviously the, the patient's a stakeholder, the doctor's a stakeholder, but looking at all the different groups that could contribute something to help us with this, then the third question was, what could each of them contribute to improving this outcome? We just started developing a list of what they could contribute, right? We just started going through all of those things. And because, including employers, they're not directly connected to the healthcare delivery system, they certainly are a stakeholder. They don't want moms delivering babies like that and then unhealthy and you know, time out of work, that kind of thing. And we, we continue to look at this. Next question was, why hasn't it already happened? And that's the barriers to success. We just looked at it. We weren't asking the right questions, number one. We were overwhelmed with the volume. We lacked the systems to access the resources that we were unaware of the need. We were distracted with competing priorities. We lacked the transformational leadership skills. Bottom line is, we just hadn't made it a priority. We didn't roll up our sleeves and do it. There were other things that were taking our attention. It's one, one more thing, right? And so what happens is it's really easy to blame the mom for like, you're not complaining, you're not eating the right foods, and you're not doing this, you're not doing that. We didn't have the systems in place to address this stuff. So how would we measure it? Simple, number of babies with fetal macrosomia being born of mothers with GDM and num over the number of mothers with GDM. It was 84% or 82% initially. We needed to get it way, way down, at least a 75% reduction. The last question is, when do we want to see progress? We needed to see an 84% reduction to 18% in three years. That was our goal. We began down the road of, of securing funding from the Kansas Health Foundation, from the Kansas Department of Health and Environment, from the, uh, from the um, United Methodist Health Ministry Fund, from from the Blue Cross Blue Shield Foundation, um, all these different sources to fund some work to get a, first of all, a maternal health navigator right at the, at the beginning who became the mom's primary point of contact. I am your guide for the remaining nine months. I'm your person. Oh, by the way, you have a doctor that will check on you every once in a while. I'm your person. And that person was from the community, knew I mean, it's almost like a doula on steroids, right? From the beginning, we're starting there, and we took all the way through, and we had that position funded. Then we took some 340B money, so prescription drug program. We took some 340B money as community benefit, put it in an account, and said, whatever this is they need to make sure that they're at the appointment, eating the right foods, whatever, it goes in this account. We gave them, empowered them 
with the resources. It was part of what we called a pioneer care advocacy team. We powered them here to fill in the gap. No, be a steward of these dollars. They're not just not just free money. Make sure, but make sure we bridge the gaps to get them whatever they need to make sure that this baby comes out the right way and they're in a healthier place than they were when they started when they came in. Then we engaged a maternal fetal medicine specialist from four hours away in Wichita. At the time, that was the closest MFM clinic. You would have to drive four hours one way. And if you're, you're a high-risk pregnancy, you're doing that weekly, right? I mean, it was almost impossible to get that done. So we convinced the Children's Miracle Network for years to, to pay for the flights, to fly this guy out once a month to see the sickest moms in the region. And not only that, give his cell phone to all of our family physicians and say, call me any time I'm your guy. And he had trained most of them to deliver high-risk babies when they were in residency. So they already knew him, they trusted him, they loved him. He agreed to make that his monthly mission. He would take a day out of his clinic because he already had half days on Friday. He'd make it a whole day on, that, on the day he had half days. He's going to come out because it was his mission to do that. And he would get out and see these folks and they would hand it back to the family physician and say, okay, I'm back in a month. Here's our plan for the next month. We're going to do this together. So there was a partnership between maternal fetal medicine and our family physicians delivering. Over a three-year period of time, we saw that 84% go down to 17 or 18%. We fixed the birth weight issue, all right, with, in partnership with the moms, right? So the term we would often use in this is, uh, you know, the, to, to build momentum was, any of you Spanish speakers? Las madres tienen las llaves del reino. The mothers hold the keys to the kingdom. If we can connect with moms, everybody else comes. So we start there. And we knew if we could create this experience for them, oh my goodness, the kids would come, the husbands come. All of a sudden, their 50-year-old husband's getting a colonoscopy, even though he swore he would never do that, right? He's getting in there because mom says, you're, I'm not being a widow, get in there. Like, you're going to your, get your scope. And then grandparents are coming in. They're getting aging to geriatric care. When it's time for them, and not beyond when it's time, when it's time for them to go into skilled care, they're coming into skilled care because mom holds the keys to the kingdom. So we figured that out. So right around that time, this ended up in the national news. And I get a cold call from a gay black guy in Atlanta. Now, that might sound like an odd way to introduce a guy in a story, but bear with me. This, gay, this guy calls me. His name's Dwayne. Cole calls me in my office and he said, Benjamin, my name is Dwayne Reynolds. I'm, ex I'm a vice president for the American Hospital Association. I'm executive vice president of its Institute for Diversity and Health Equity, which is a mouthful to me. Um, but he's calling. He said, hey, I read about what y'all are doing, about, especially among women of color and maternal health equity and this work. It was a Politico story and all this stuff. And so I, I was thinking in the back of my mind, like, brother, why are you calling me? Like, we're way out here, right? And he said, uh, well, I'm calling because I'd like you to sit on our board. And I thought, didn't say it out loud, is this dude aware that I'm sort of slightly right of center, middle of nowhere, white guy, living in the middle of the country in Kansas? I wear boots to work. Like, see, no, like, it's not like I'm against equity, but, like, I'm trying to do this work out here, but I didn't think I was invited to this party. I said all that stuff in my mind. But what I said to him was, like, well, Dwayne, um, thanks for calling. Why, why, why me? And he said two things to me that I'll share with you because I think they're applicable here. Number one, as health equity has risen to the center of the national conversation, it has largely overlooked the disparities between rural and urban Americans. Essentially, the inclusion movement is excluding rural America. Not okay. He said, we're doing this to the detriment of our own work in racial equity. It's harming us. Two, we tend to villainize white guys. Treat him as public enemy number one. He said, I believe if we're ever going to get to equity in this country, if our national creed's ever going to become a reality, it's going to be, it's going to be with the buy-in and support of some folks like you. Because whether I like it or not, white dudes still have a whole lot of power. So he said, guilt and shame and judgment and blame, they're powerful emotions and they can change behavior for a time. But they don't change hearts. And what I believe America needs is a heart change. So rather than call you out for being a white guy in boots from a small town, I'm calling you in to some of the most important work of our generation. I'm asking you if you have the courage to be the only straight white guy on a board of 20 people. <laughs> I was not expecting this from this guy. And even then, I didn't right away say yes. I said, you know, I wonder if you'd be willing to come out and see where I live. Um, and then extend that very generous invitation to me, thinking, man, I'm just still not sure I'm what you need. 
And uh, so he flew out with two other people from the American Hospital Association, filmed a video on rural health equity, interviewing local people, interviewing physicians, local community members, county commissioners, other people in the community, just regular patients, making the case that rural, if rural America is the backbone of the United States, and if rural America is not healthy, then rural America has back problems, and when the backs, uh, then America has back problems, and when that's that's when when a person has back problems, nothing else works right. We well, got to prioritize rural health equity. He did that. He showed up. He ate Rocky Mountain oysters with us at a local restaurant. Y'all know what Rocky Mountain oysters are? <laughs> Calf fries, right? I mean, for those of y'all that aren't aware, it's sliced, breaded, fried bull testicles. He ate those with us, knowing full well what they were. He stayed in our home. He played with our kids. He had me. I said, I'll, I'll, do what, what, I'll sit on whatever board you want me to sit on, man. I'm in. He said, well, then you've got to come to Atlanta and eat some chitlins with me. I was like, now that's next level. And we remain good friends today. So I'm going to give you the three other stories um, where this happened. But I want you to, to keep that with you, that one, you have a seat at the health equity table. And if there are microaggressions going on, people are treating you poorly in those spaces, show up anyway. Show up anyway, not with a chip on your shoulder if possible, show up with kindness, show up and engage, show up, be direct, show up, be, be prepared, be educated, be informed, and show up. Because there are people in your communities who will live or die based on whether rural health, rural health equity is a part of the national conversation. And you are among the most edu educated and informed and equipped people in the state of Arizona to engage in that conversation. You have a responsibility to be there. All right? So I'll give you another example of how this plays out. This is a guy named Joe LaBelle. Now, Joe LaBelle's a dishwasher. He's 21 years old at the time. I was a new hospital administrator of a place with four days of cash on hand. Anybody with a finance background? That's no bueno, right? Uh, that's, like, that's like rolling pennies to pay the gas bill. That's like holding accounts payable to make payroll. Anybody getting hypertension right now, right? Um, so I, I was 29 years old and green enough to believe, hey, that can, you know, we can fix this. Um, not realizing the implications of, like, the immediate implications of four days of cash on hand, right? Well, I'm getting to know the staff in this new facility, and I took him on a road trip to the airport to pick up my wife, who's finished a teaching contract. She wasn't even there yet. And uh, he was telling me how his grandmother had passed away from breast cancer, that she didn't find out until stage four. And when I asked her why, he said, you know, she didn't have access to a mammogram machine. And the nearest digital mammogram machine was two and a half hours away, right? So if you live in Wichita, poor or wealthy, either one, you're, you're in a short distance, relatively short geographic distance to get there. Whether you're wealthy or poor or whatever, you're two and a half hours away in our community from getting to that digital. So she just didn't make it a priority. She couldn't. Didn't, kids needed shoes, whatever it was. She didn't get the She ended up passing away. And I, and I was, so I was just facing, because I'd come from Dallas most recently. Like, this is just a new world to me. And, and so I said, what do you think we ought to do about that? And he said, well, I think we ought to have a basketball game. And I said, a basketball game? What does basketball have to do with your mom's or your grandmother's mammogram? And he just said, and as plain as he could, he said, and if you want to reach people for a cause that matters, you do it in the language they can understand. In Kansas, we understand basketball. I said, why basketball? He's like, who did they hire? He's like, man, basketball was invented in Kansas. I said, that's debatable. He said, it is not debatable. You go to Lawrence, Kansas, you experience the fog. They think they have basketball in these other places. We do basketball in Kansas. And so I said, okay, you want to have a basketball game? He said, yeah, I want to have two, two girls' teams play each other in pink uniforms. We'll charge some money at the door. And we use that money to pay for mammograms for women that can't get access to them. And if we get, raise enough money, we can get the bus to come here. And then they don't even have to drive. And we can limit the access issue. We can, I mean, this, guy, it's, this dishwasher was on fire for this, man. So I, I, I said, well, you get after it then. And, and he calls the state, and the state says you can't have any more than three players playing on a team outside this season because it'll jeopardize the season. There's some kind of activities, association rules or something. They told him, go have a barbecue, do something else. He said, no, then we're going to have three current players on either team, three recent graduates from either team, so six locals, and nine celebrity players. I said, celebrity players? I'm picturing like the 59-year-old math teacher going up for a layup. I'm thinking, are people going to pay money for that? And he, I said, who do you have in mind for celebrities? And he said, well, there's this player by the name of Jackie Stiles came out of Claflin, Kansas, an hour and a half away from us. She played in our high school gym in high school, but she went to Missouri State University, and she, she broke the NCAA's all-time scoring record for uh, uh, when she was there. And I said, I'm aware of Jackie Stiles. I was in college the same four years she was in Springfield, Missouri. 
Um, I suppose you know her. He said, no, but her dad's still the track coach of that high school. What if we call up her dad and you figure that out? And so sure enough, her dad said, hey, she'd like to play in this. Here's her cell number. And we called and Jackie committed to come. I said, well, Joe, who else you got in mind? He said, well, there's this player from Kansas State named Shaylee Lenning. And she led the nation in assists this year and took her team to the Sweet 16. And she just got drafted by the WNBA's Atlanta Dream. I said, I said okay. He said, she's from an hour away in Sublette, Kansas. I said, is that right? I said, I suppose you got her number. He said, no, but there's this rancher that's a booster <laughs> at Kansas State. And I bet he knows the athletic. He gives a lot of money. I bet he knows the athletic director. Sure enough, the athletic director knew the basketball coach's number, knew Shaley's number. And with that, that afternoon, they had her number. And she said, well, Jackie's coming. I'm coming. Well, then players from K-State, K KU, Missouri, Missouri State, Iowa, USC, Notre Dame, Southern California, Tennessee, Oklahoma, Oklahoma State, University of Texas, um, Old Dominion University, University of Tennessee, on and on committed to playing this game because they all loved Jackie. Jackie was the best to ever play the game at the time. Then the KU cheerleaders said, well, we're going to be the cheerleaders for the game. Then the K-State cheerleaders said... <laughs> Well, if KU come, this is West Kansas. We're not just coming with our cheerleaders. We're going to bring our pep band because we're not going to be outdone by KU. So they brought literally the pep band that plays at K-State basketball games to come play in this gym, this town of 900 people, right? So this is just building up. Well, then they agreed to, to teach, to work together on some KU, K-State, if you can imagine that, work together to teach a cheer clinic for little girls in the region. And they would pay money to come be part of this, and all that would go to the cause as well. Well, then two, two opera singers agreed to fly in from New York to sing the national anthem at the game. Well, then um, Fox Sports Network agreed to broadcast the game live from coast to coast. Like, come out and wire this 1965 old gym, like, to set up for a broadcast like it was, like, game day or something. They agreed to come out and do that. Well, then Shamiqua Holdsclaw, at one point Nike's highest paid female athlete and one of the greatest women's basketball players of all time, agreed to come out and coach and be part of the game. Well, she had attempted suicide in 2000 before a WNBA game. So in addition to coming, she agreed to speak to a group of about 100 women about the importance <coughs> of getting ahead of behavioral health stuff and speaking up when, she began, when you begin to feel this way. So it began to become more of a public health event even than just a basketball game. Well, then Tamika Catchings, three or four years ago, um, the MVP for the WNBA, four-time Olympic gold medalist, agreed to not only come out to, to be there, but also to speak to a group of, of uh, school kids um, f about the consequences or impact of bullying because she grew up with a hearing impairment. She couldn't hear. It was a hearing difference. And she agreed uh, to come out and talk about her story with that as the greatest player in the game the year she came out. She was the MVP, came out to do this. Um, and these are six, three, six, four black women showing up in this town of 900 people. And there is no hotel, so where do you think they had to stay? They stayed in people's homes. And the only beds big enough are the king size suites in these ranchers' houses. So they moved onto the couch or into a guest bedroom. And these women are sleeping in their room because that's the only place they could be. So it started to change the culture within the community. So then the game happens. In the first year, it raised $70,000. And ultimately, over a 10-year period of time and until COVID, it went on every year, raising over a half a million dollars and ultimately did fund this bus coming out. And it still comes out every month. And they clean out the bank one month, and now all those women get mammogram, whether they want to or not. <laughs> Peer pressure is the son of a gun. So they get in there, and they get their screening. And, but it pays for pap smears, mammograms, colonoscopies, and HPV vaccines for any women who live in those communities if they are, um, if they are, they have an ID that shows they live there and, and they, are, they are women, that's it. And, and now it moved beyond that even in year seven or eight, pays for any person's cancer, cancer prevention care, man, woman or otherwise, pays, pays for all of that and continues. Now it's almost like an endowment. It just sits there and it helps. Whatever your insurance doesn't pay for, it picks up, so it makes it free. And if, if you don't have insurance, it pays for all of it. And they've negotiated rates with the hospitals in the area. Um, two doctors were watching this game from Texas and Oklahoma on national TV and agreed to move to this community because they said, if you care that much about your health care, we want to come be part of you. And so they ended up help, helping restore their medical staff because they came. I say all of this to say that this idea came from a 21-year-old dishwasher in the kitchen. I could have never thought of this as a hospital CEO. I just was once just surprised one step after the next. Like, oh, so that happened. All right, well, this, I mean, if anything, I listened to him and I got out of his way 
and let it go. And this is Joe LaBelle at halftime on national TV telling the story about what happened. Solutions often come from people who are closest to the most complex problems. And as leaders, we must listen to and empower them to innovate. Here's the next example. In, in one of the hospitals where I was the CEO, we had accusations, we had huge turnover in our dietary department. Ac accusations of racism, there's conflict, there's interpersonal issues, there's people calling in last minute. It was high, highest turnover in the whole building and the dietary manager was fit to be tied about it. She, here is a white woman married to a, a self-identifying Hispanic man and she's being accused of being racist on both sides by white folks and Hispanic folks. So, so she's just frustrated. And she said, look, can you, can you help? The chief operating officer who oversaw her couldn't figure it out either and so said, can you meet with these people? So I agreed to meet with these people for you know, about a week. I met with all 40, 35 or 40 of the folks in the department. Getting their side of the story and hearing them out and you know, it's, it's he said, she said, and her problem and his, there's some blame in there. Second to the last person that walks in, didn't speak a word of English. Right? She was Mexican-American, first generation, didn't speak any English, walks in almost trembling because in her culture, as she described it later, we don't speak like this to people in authority. So I'm calling her, and it's almost like the principal's office, and she walks in and she hands me six pieces of paper. They were like the grocery list with the lines on them, the long, skinny pieces of paper, hands them to me. And, on the fir and, they, were, and they were stapled into pairs, you know, or paper clipped into pairs, and on the, on the first one of those two pieces of paper. There was a clearly defined problem that she had typed into Google Translate, translated into English, and then copied down the letters, the characters, so that I would understand the problem that she was describing. On the second piece was the solution to that problem. We exchanged almost no words in that meeting, but I was dumbfounded and just floored that this had happened. First problem she identified. There's tension related to language barriers in the work environment, leading to accusations of racism and bullying. Solution, when conversations are occurring in a work environment and a person who does not speak that language is present, bilingual employees should translate to promote team unity and ensure all members are included. She's talking about me in Spanish. She's talking about me, blah, 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 blah. That, that kind of thing was going on. Well, this is a common decency issue, she said. Just whoever is, there's enough of us that are bilingual that anybody, we just bring them into the conversation. It's a basic lesson in belonging. Can we make that a policy? Number one. Number two, employees feel stifled and bored in their current roles, perceiving lack of opportunity for professional advancement. Solution, incentivize versatility. Identify hard-to-fill positions across the organization. Whenever possible, cross-train employees into those other positions. Offer wage differentials to float into departments where there is need. Pay the higher wage for cross-trained employee, no matter the specific work for the given day. If they're going to be versatile, if you can use them anywhere, pay them more for it. It'll, it'll work out in the long run. Number two. Number three, there's perception that low-performing employees lack accountability from leadership due to nepotism. Modify the organizational chart to ensure that no employee is directly or indirectly supervised and or held accountable by a family member, require annual evaluations with objective measurements for every employee. There was a dietary worker with mental health issues that were unchecked that she was unwilling to be treated for who was the sister of the chief operating officer. And nobody felt like they could deal with her behaviors. And the chief operating officer had a blind spot. She wasn't really looking at this. And that was wreaking havoc on the culture. So we addressed each of these three things, turnover flattened in dietary. It went away. And that came from a woman who didn't speak one word of English. Leaders create emotionally safe environments that empower all people, people at all organization levels to contribute to solutions. She had so much courage in coming in, and we have an ethical responsibility to invite that in, create a safe space for that, and affirm that, and celebrate it. Fortunately, unfortunately, she wanted no recognition for it. She didn't want to be, she didn't want her name mentioned anywhere. She just was glad that the changes were made, and so we had to respect how she didn't want to be recognized for that, because we asked her, do you want, do you want this or not? So that had a profound impact on our overall organizational turnover rate, because when you look at the bell curve, if you deal with the stuff on the far side, the bell curve, the most challenging area, the whole bell curve moves, right? So that was the area of highest turnover. So helpful. Here's another example. We had an MA turnover issue, medical assistant turnover issue. And, uh, and this guy said, uh, you know, it was a chronic problem, and this guy's a family physician, one year out of residency, came in to, uh, <clears throat> to, to meet with me. And, and, uh, 
and I was expected to get blitzed because he'd been through three MAs in his first year out of residency. High values his time, high values time of others. So he said, um, hey, uh, I, um, I have an idea. He said, I've lost three MAs. I visited with each of the MAs. They're leaving for four bucks an hour or more. And they're leaving because they can't afford the very service they're providing to the patients that we're serving. He said, and they're leaving healthcare altogether. They're going into different industries. But I, I visited with the CFO. So I'm like, my ears perked up. You did what? visited with the CFO, and I figured out that if we gave every one of our MAs $4 an hour increase, including the, the benefits, um, it would have cost this amount of money. But I think they really even need additional education to be better, too. And it would cost this amount of money to get them through an online certification program. If we do all that, um, it would cost this amount of money. So I looked at our own contracts, figured out we get $45 an hour for ER call. It's kind of like just a bonus to sweeten the bitter taste of being on call because we already get paid for collections or for productivity in that area. If we reduced our part, all of the doctors together, to, to down to uh, 40 bucks an hour instead of $45 an hour, it would more than cover the entire cost of the increase for all the MAs. So I visited with every one of my partners that we share a call with, and they're all willing to sign a half-page addendum to, to their contracts if we use the money for this. Can we do this? I wanted to, like, hug the guy in the <laughs> office. Yes, 90 days, MA turnover flattened. It stopped. We gave him a buck right out of the gate. And as soon as they finished that course on their own time, they got the other $3, and that's what happened. He defined the problem, defined the solution, but he had done the front-end work. Very different conversation with me as a CEO says, hey, would you like to take a pay cut to give the MAs more money? It doesn't go over the same. But he took responsibility. What happened to him financially the following year? What do you think? He made more money. Why? Because his clinic was efficient. He didn't do it for that. That's not what made this guy go. But the physicians, each of them, their compensation increased because their clinic was more efficient. Patients are happy because they're not waiting in waiting rooms. The MAs are feeling invigorated because they're growing and thriving. That came from the front line. Don't underestimate the potential of others to solve their own problems, especially when they invite others to contribute. Empower them, support them with affirmation. I'm going to round this out and close it with this. Um, a friend of Sister Mary Jean, friend of mine, um, I get to meet with her once a month. This is Maureen Bisignano. And um, she was co-founder of the Institute for Health Improvement with Don Berwick. And so I get to meet with her every three weeks or, or a month. We spend about a half an hour together, and she just hands me wisdom. And she said, before capturing a patient's biology, first capture their biography. Before capturing a patient's lab results, hear their story, why they came in what they're here for, what brings them joy, what matters most to them. And uh, she, she would go on and say, ask your patients, your staff, your families, yourself, those two questions. Work it into the electronic medical record within your organizations where there's, there's a template where you can capture why they came in and what matters most to them. Not just open text, right, but, but what matters most to them and what brings them joy so that you know what, what they're hoping for, what they're working toward, instead of just assuming we know or not caring. Um, so I'll leave you with these things. If we want systemic change within our organizations in a rural health context, you, here are some nuggets I've learned the hard way. Number one, identify the right thing to do by asking patients what matters most to them. Because they, they define it, number one. Number two, you got to hack the system. you got to bootleg the funding. If it's from this organization or another one, you got to bootleg the funding to figure out how to pay for the right thing and implement it, right? Third is implement the right thing and meticulously track the outcomes doing it so you can prove the right thing works or doesn't work. Fourth, leverage media and other storytellers. Tell the story for doing the right thing and use that to change policy. Use that to change payment. Start over. What's the right thing to do? Um, here's the tool to take away. What outcome needs improvement? Pick one. Pick an easy one. Start with the easy, work toward the hardest stuff later. Two, who are the stakeholders? Start with the willing. Let the willing convince the unwilling for you. I'll start with the hardest one to get to. Start with the willing ones that want to make the change, to do the easy things. Don't stop at the easy bit, start there. Where could each stakeholder contribute? How could they contribute to improving the outcome? Why isn't it already happening? Don't overlook the barriers to success or we're, we're, we're done before we start. 
How do we measure its success? Because if we don't measure it, it doesn't matter. No commitment to measurements, no commitment at all. And lastly, when do we expect to see progress? When do we expect to see progress? Put a timeline on it. Smart goals have timelines, right? It is so important that we listen to the people that are most affected by the decisions we're making and the systems we're transforming. We got to start with them. We got to keep them involved all the way long. And I want to think about this. If we were to invite everybody to contribute to this, if it wasn't just the CEO or the C-level team or the board or a few physicians, a few folks, what would the picture we're painting look like? If not only everybody was invited, but everybody picked up the paintbrush and contributed to that solution. I want to thank you so much for having me, and I look forward to the discussion. Our question was, how did you get uh, board support or board buy-in for some of your products? Like, as a former board member uh, come to me with a basketball game, like, okay, how did we get the ball rolling to get that support to get it going? <laughs> Yeah, I think, I think back to the hospital was in such dire shape that we had created, started creating a series. I don't know if you all have cultural issues in your organizations or, you know, sense of fatalism sets in. And this place has just gotten used to losing. Like, now oh, we're hanging on to the marbles we got left till the last marble's gone, right? It was kind of this doom and gloom mentality that's, that's I think, unfortunately set into even more rural America. And we were looking for early wins, and so we'd had a few of them, like we... We agreed we were going to, in a 38-mile relay, we were going to run the game ball for a basketball game from one town to another 38 miles. So we got the police behind us, and, or EMS behind us, and police in front of us because they're little two-lane roads with no shoulder. I mean, it's dangerous as all get out to do this without cover, right? So we got them involved, and, and so we were just looking for wins. Well, every participant, you know, a hospital employee find a friend or two, and everybody paid 10 bucks to be involved, and that money bought new uniforms for their town's pride and joy, which is the basketball team, right? So that was a win where people were building momentum. And it really wasn't even about health care or even about the uniforms, which was just we're going to do something together and we're going to win. And then the next one, we did an extreme makeover clinic edition where their lumber yard agreed to stay open 24 hours. And for like a six or $7,000 budget, we redid the carpet and the painted the walls and new light fixtures and just cleaned it up a little bit, spruced it up. And and so, but it you know, looked like a different clinic when you walked in there, but it didn't cost all that much money with all the labor donated, but it was 24 hours, everybody worked around the town. And then, and then they got something new they were proud of. And so we'd already had a few of those wins with the board. And so when the dishwasher comes forward with this thing, so long as it doesn't cost the hospital money, knock yourself out, right? Go ahead. And we didn't have a budget for it, so we had to figure out how to do it without any money. Um, and so it turns out the sheriff busted some drug dealers with a whole bunch of money. <laughs> that if you keep it for 90 days, they don't claim it, it becomes property of the county. So they use the money from the drug dealers to pay all, the, all these gals to fly in. And we thought, you know, if the drug lords knew what a good cause, <laughs> certainly they would have, right? So we just had to figure out, well, who has the resources? It goes back to those six questions. Like, who are the stakeholders and what can they help with? We didn't have any. It's not like I had to go get permission. Can we please allocate some of the, the plentiful money we have to this? We had no money. But, but that rallied folks around something that was bigger than them, and that began to attract folks that wouldn't have otherwise worked in our organization to do that. So I think eventually they said, I think we need like a board resolution to endorse you to spend some time on this, like to help out with it. And that was just them saying, we, we bless this, you know. But it, we didn't have any money, so as long as it didn't cost money. But I think it's just stakeholder buy-in happens one conversation at a time. And that board happened to be highly influenced by the community movement, right? So if the community is for it, well, then the board, oh, yeah, yeah, well, then we're going to be for it because they, they're a community-elected board. They don't want to get crossways with the community that elects them. So we got community moving in that direction. Kept them informed, you know, in our monthly meetings, but so they weren't surprised. You never want a board to be surprised. And the board never needs to surprise the hospital CEO, CEO should never surprise the board, so we just kept them involved. Does that answer your question? Table two? All right, table four followed by table eight. So I feel like as leaders, we're often brought problems and asked to solve them. Mm -hmm. And when you do pose that question to your staff, um, what is your solution, and you get no response, how do you recommend prompting them forward to help you come up with a solution that will fit them? My, my response has been, I'm, I'm very open to 
to ideas. I mean, I hand them, essentially, I hand them the six, a worksheet with those six questions on it and say, this is how you fill this out. Let's have a conversation after you filled it out. What would you do? Who would you involve? And, and that, I think we get a lot more value for somebody 17 bucks an hour when we engage their mind to solve problems instead of their hands to wash dishes. Still wash the dishes, they need to be washed, but let's, we need your mind too because you know the problem better than I do. And then reward it, even if it's just with a card or some sort of public recognition or however they want to be rewarded. Reward that, and that starts building momentum. And there are people in every organization, not always the one coming to you whining about it, right? But there are people in every organization that have the ability to think that way who may not have been engaged. So you can start, again, with the willing. Say, hey, we've got this issue. And so one hospital in Colorado, for example, put together what's called a MacGyver team. How many of y'all are old enough to remember MacGyver? <laughs> There's a new one. There's a new one. Okay. Yeah. I haven't seen the new one, so I'm, I guess I'm in between. Um, all these, these edgy thinkers, about a dozen of them in this hospital, 300, she, and, and they brought them together at the outset of COVID and said, here are the unsolved problems. Please hack them for us. We're going to meet next week. We need, solve, we need immediate solutions to these issues around space and around negative pressure rooms and around, um, you know, PPE and these types of things. And what came was, you know, village sewing groups coming together, putting radiator filters in between cloth and producing these mat when no when when an N95 was 20 bucks, right? I mean, we they were finding these solutions. So I think identifying who those hackers are in your organization and starting there and just empowering them, make that, that a group that people want to be part of. Like, how do I get into that? Because that kind of thinking grows. You start with the willing though. Not just the one whining, because they're generally, no, I don't want a solution. I want you to fix it, right? And so, oh, my gosh, it happens so much. But saying, well, Sally May over here, she, fi she fixed that thing. She came with a solution. Here's the tool she used. Come back to me with a solution, and let's talk, because I'm open. I want to hear what you have to say. That, that's one way. There's probably many ways. <laughs> Does that answer your question, table four? I try not to say quit your whining, yeah. but I think it. <laughs> I think it. Think it to yourself. <laughs> yeah. um, table eight and then table five, do you want to have a question this round? I didn't check with you. Do you all want to ask a question or would you like to be skipped? Well, let the group ask questions. Okay, y'all are skipped. Quiet, don't you all right, you're okay. Table eight and then back to table one. My people. I'm a table eighter. That's right, you were table eight. <laughs> We don't have any questions, but we just want to thank you for an amazing presentation and for such insightful words. You know, we're over here writing as fast as we can so we can copy all your words of wisdom, your nuggets of knowledge that is going to help propel us forward. So thank you. Thank you for that. I appreciate it. Y'all were too easy on him just because he was at your table. That's probably true. Table one followed by table seven. Uh, Benjamin uh, from table one, thank you very much. I do agree with the comment from the other side of the room about helping uh, rural health care, but I know you're connected to the Colorado Hospital Association. So uh, could you possibly, you're wearing boots, could you possibly take a big step up to the American Hospital Association <laughs> and get out to Washington in the lobby, please? Thank you. I appreciate that. Thank you. Oh, that leads into a good question if anybody wants to ask that next question. Anybody here from the AHA? Nope. Feel Just free. Curious. So we have a question for you. Was the hospital in Kansas a critical access hospital? Was. And how did you get so many services available to the communities? And do they still have OB services? They do. They're delivering almost 400 babies a year now. Um, so we had a... So we, we decided we're going to focus on some things and do some things well instead of trying to do all things. We, and we declined to do some tempting things. It could have been revenue generating and other things. We focused on full scope family medicine really well. Like we just said, we're going to be great. We're going to resist the temptation to get one pediatrician, one general surgeon, one OBGYN, one internist, to be on call 24-7 with some expensive locum support so they could ever get a vacation. We're just going to do family medicine, full scope, get, find the programs that train that really well, and focus on doing that really well, beginning to end of life. And we attracted them. It's this, this a longer story, but we attracted them um, through a concept we called soil health for people. So 
we analyzed what it was like to live and work in our community using uh, the University of North Dakota's community APGAR framework. It's a it well. 50 criteria framework. So we got, we got the information from that, but then we took a step further, which I don't know that anybody's done yet, other than what we were doing, which is bucket that data into the United States Department of Agriculture's principles of soil health. Maximize living roots, minimize disturbance, maximize biodiversity, maximize soil cover. Maximize or, uh, living roots, take care of existing people. Minimize disturbance, get, deal with the dysfunction that drive people off and produce moral injury, right? Uh, maximize biodiversity, remove bio, what's the organization's holistic view of diversity, not just race, but all forms of diversity and perspective and emotional safety to disagree, those types of things, and then maximize soil cover. That's the innovation in between harvest. Keep it something on the ground so that what you have doesn't blow away, right? So we looked at that and had to take an honest look at our own selves, smell our pits, to use a crude analogy, and realize we stink. We need to wash. And so when we addressed those things, we attracted family medicine in, and we started seeing people drive from communities 10 times the size of ours past specialists into our community because those physicians, we had looked at their character, their training, their ability to connect with people, their cultural sensitivity, and we gave them 10 weeks of paid time off, these doctors, to serve anywhere in the world they wanted to go, and refugees started taking them home with them. And so when they had that, they had immediately had the hearts of the community. And they were bringing, again, moms brought everybody else, but we just saw massive growth in primary care once those doctors connected at a heart level with patients. Can I ask one more question? Yeah. Um, I'm the FLEX coordinator yeah. at the Center for Rural Health. How did, how did the FLEX programs support you or support um, that hospital? <laughs> they didn't then. I've been doing a lot of work through FLEX then educating and telling other states and, and like doing education around this stuff. So Flex, is, I'm very, a lot more familiar with Flex now than I was at the time. At the time we didn't have any money, we just had to hack it. Figured out and what we did was just looked at how much we spent on locums. What would we spend on 10 weeks off? And really, it's like CME, vacation, all the things put together. We're not already spending eight weeks and some changes, bumped it up a little bit. So we really didn't have grant money to do that specifically. I sure wish I would have known about Flex at the time. And so. Flex is a wonderful program, and um, yeah, I'm, I admire what you're doing. It's really important. All right, table three, followed by table six. Come on, Elias, think of a question. <laughs> the only thing that we had talked about is you were saying that rural health uh, should have a seat at the table. Yeah. And so you have a bunch of rural health, I think, hospital workers here, where should we start? What are some of the um, groups we should get involved with where we're going to get the most bang for our buck because our time is limited? Uh, I think start in your local community. Um, by taking what you're already measuring, divided by people group, identify a disparity and fix something simple. Get the media involved to tell that story. We are the, Nationally, we are starving for wins. What you are doing, I looked at the transportation stuff, the, the front end screening, like dealing with the systems, the structures, the information stuff, like that's not new science. 30 or 40 years old, it's super hard where you live. What we were doing in Lake in Kansas wasn't that innovative. Time off, okay. Um, Maternal health, I mean, they're dealing with that in Boston 20 years ago. It's notable because it was in Lakin. And what you're doing, where you're doing it, has national relevance. The story of your community is the story of rural America. You start there, you get a win, and then the, the mistake I think rural Americans make so often is we don't tell our story, we're America's best kept secret. Humble. You know, deflect attention. I don't want the spotlight on me. I don't want to draw that attention locally to appear prideful or it's this false sense of humility thing like we do. It's so important that that story is told. And I'll tell you, with the media comes the money. And with the money, we can do all kinds of good things for vulnerable populations. And they're looking to tell the story. So what I found was sort of like the back door. Like just sort of fixing things locally. Media picked that up. Dwayne calls from D.C., well, you want to be on this board or that board, but you're already fixing the problems, and then they need that perspective on these boards. Rather than finding the board to sit on to talk about the things before you fix the things, start with fixing the things. 
and the rest of it just follows. There's gobs of money that will come to you all when you start fixing these problems, and you already are doing it. That's exciting. All right, that was table three. We're back to table six. Do you have another question, table six? Nope. The, oh, we thought of one. Thought of one. Where did you, uh, where did you start to attract physicians to come into your community? Uh, we started by looking at the systems, our own mission, vision, and values within our organization, and looking at our community and how uninviting it was. The reason why we use soil health is because ranchers and farmers, it's easier to say, you know, let's look at the soil than to say, you're uninviting. The two fingers off the top of the steering wheel actually isn't hospitality. Like, having somebody over is. Like, breaking bread is. And that's not intuitive, at least in our community. Maybe, maybe Arizonans are the most hospitable folks in the United States. West Kansans, not. Like, it's not that we don't like you. We just don't think about you. We don't really care. We have our Sunday after church people. And you'll be in it about five years if you can hang in long enough. Show up to enough ball games, hang out long enough, somebody eventually let you over. Usually another transplant. So we had to look at that environment and imagine if this were my brother, if this were my sister, what would I do for them? Who are going to be their kids' cousins? Who will be their siblings? Who will be their surrogate grandparents? Where will they live? What would I do for them? If, I, if they were my brother, I would be scouring the entire town looking for the house that's not on the market to get them into the right place. Why don't we do that? And we had that stuff in place, and we addressed the internal stuff around. The, so the four components we had to implement were standardized roles. Everyone's on call for the same thing. Two, equitable call structure. Everyone's on call the same amount. I don't care if you're 70 and you're on call for 12 years straight in the 80s. Wine somewhere else. We're all doing this the same. Um, th third, because the new ones won't do that. They're not going to get dumped on. They don't even want to do the call that they, that they did previously. So third is um, in uh, fair, fair and just compensation. Not exorbitant, but fair compensation. The fourth is a mission-driven culture. We had to align the mission of the organization. First of all, clearly define it. And if it's some written by some lawyer in the 1980s and it's a paragraph we haven't even looked at, and our mission is to, to help people, that's nonsense. No mission-driven provider wants to come into that. And then fourth was, yeah, we just had to make sure that they were aligned with, with, the, with the people that we were after. And so from a practical standpoint, we went to those residencies that are training the best family medicine residents in the country and said, will you do your locums work here? We want to know what you think about this place when you leave a shift. Well, the CMR is broken. This nurse cursed at me. Whatever the thing is, and we started fixing the things that those faculty were telling us, and just intuitively they started sending us residents. Because those faculty to make enough money to make men's meet, they often do locums. We just wanted them doing it here, and they saw more of a mission than just I'm going to get paid to go work the ER. It was, it was with purpose. And so are they doing locums in the ER mostly? Yeah, ER, inpatient, they do some clinic. But mainly, we just wanted to get them in some way. If we're already going to have to pay for locums, might as well pay the faculty of these residencies so they can tell us. And every time they'd leave, I'd have them either text me or slip a note under my door saying, hey, I noticed these things. And we'd fix them. So when they came back six weeks later, gosh, wow, you listened. They go back and tell the residents, administration, the other meds that they listen. And one follow-up question is that, what about nursing staff? So it's hard to find nursing staff who live in rural America. Yeah. And so a lot of people are commuting. Yep. Uh, what about nursing staff? So the, same, the same exact, so I'm going to North Dakota in June to do this community APGAR soil health thing with North Dakota nursing, nursing leaders. And they're gonna talk about like getting a demonstration project going, having some grant money, flex money actually fund it, like getting that, that going. Same concepts work there. I would say more than, more than people care about location, certainly more than they care about money, more than they care about even their call schedule, which is important, they care about community. And that's not ball games and hot dog feeds. It's deep, meaningful, authentic human relationships with other human beings. It's belonging. They will move five hours away from the nearest city to some dirty town with feedlots on every side of it. So no matter what way that famous Kansas wind blows, it smells like poop. They'll move there with assurance that they're going to know others and they're going to be known by other people. And so I would say start by recruiting in bulk recruit half a nursing school class and accommodate for them like they're all in one big group. They're all going to get housing. 
you're going to help find child care, you're going to do everything you would do for that group of nurses as a family, so they come in with immediate community. They already know their classmates they have. It's almost like a union without a union. They've got a voice. I feel like they're coming in together. So administration, be ready to accommodate because they're going to have a bigger, a bigger voice. And you'll find the immediate savings because you're not paying you're not paying locums or you're not paying these agency rates, right? So I think nurses, the same thing applies. And so it's, it's treating people like people and doing what you would do if they were your family. And rural Americans, I, I mean, I've dogged on us a little bit, you know, like we're not inviting and this and that. Rural Americans are some of the best human beings in the world once they let you in. Honest as the day is long, hardworking, like do, do the right thing when no one's looking, like the kind of people you want your kids growing up like. You just don't know it until they let you in, and it takes four to five years, and that is absolutely unacceptable. And is the, outcome, the outcomes we are seeing is the result of that. We are killing ourselves with our own exclusion. All right. Thank you. Let's thank Benjamin one more time. Thank you. Thank you very much. My grandmother would say, appreciate you. <laughs> and in Texas, that's one word. So appreciate y'all. <laughs>